You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, Dave. Hello, David. Hello, Will. Hey. And hello to our listeners, and welcome to this very special Common Descent Spotlight mini-series, where instead of our typical format, uh, where we discuss a particular scientific topic, we're focusing instead on some of the specific scientific people working in our favorite field of science. For this particular run of this particular mini-series, we have chosen the theme of invertebrate paleontology. So today, we are joined by invertebrate paleontologist Dave Marshall. Uh, Dave, please introduce yourself. Yes, so I'm Dave, and I have the honor of representing uh, all of invertebrate paleontology, which I think represents, you know what, like 85% of it. (laughs) So that's quite an (laughs) honor you've bestowed upon me. I am a PhD candidate, PhD student at the University of Bristol, and I study Eurypterids, which are arthropods. Uh, our listeners, if you if you are in the habit of listening to paleontology podcasts, you might recognize Dave by his name or his voice, because he is the host of what I consider the paleontology podcast. <laughs> you, you might disagree with that, uh, but Paleocast, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later on, too. Yeah, it turns out we're, we're not actually the first. When when I started, I thought we were the first, but then it's, it's since transpired that there are older ones out there. I think oh. um, Dinosaur George has been going an incredibly yes. long time. And so I, I only found out about that one recently. So I always thought we were original, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Someone beat you to it. Mm-hmm. Ah, well. Well, we'll talk a bit about podcasting later. Let's start by talking about... The science, the research. So as you said, you study Eurypterids. So for any of our listeners who don't know what that word means, please tell us what are Eurypterids? Well, I wouldn't be surprised if people didn't know what Eurypterids were. Uh, They're they're not very well known in public. Uh, So they are chelicerate arthropods. So those are things with chelicerae. So if you think uh, spiders and scorpions, they all have these uh, kind of like fang shaped appendages at the front. And that's what they use to bite things with and inject venom and do all of that kind of stuff. So uh, they're chelicerate arthropods, uh, but they are aquatic. So they're very similar to horseshoe crabs. So for people in America and those in Asia, you might be familiar with them. And sort of in between horseshoe crabs and arachnids, the spiders and scorpions and stuff like that. But we don't exactly know how they relate to each different group. They're they're kind of in between those. So Eurypterids are very famous Paleozoic creatures. So these, these are running that era before the Age of Reptiles. What, Ordovician do they get started? Yeah. So 450 plus million years ago? 460. Okay. Some people may be more familiar familiar with Eurypterids as sea scorpions, and they're called that because they really resemble regular scorpions. And they've, they've got like the same number of segments. They They just look the same from the outside, but there's... So many different um, differences in terms of how they have to be adapted to their different environments. Sea scorpions are in the sea, uh, real scorpions are on land. And so there's a huge lot of internal stuff that's going on, even if the external is pretty much still the same. Yeah, that's the the famous term that uh, always comes up, that sea scorpion. And it's also a very exciting term, I think. You know, that that sounds cool. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes, it does. Well, you've seen them on the documentaries. I yes, think you it do. was Walking with Monsters had like the big terrifying sea scorpion chasing trilobites and stuff. They did get big. They got they got to be very big, right, Dave? They got to be huge. So the one on uh that documentary was called Megalograptus and that was one of the very first uh sea scorpions, but then uh later ones got even bigger and they are the biggest arthropods that have been described and the biggest one called jacolopterus was i think 2.8 meters long which is 
pretty <laughs> wow. pretty big bigger than me what was the typical size of a eurypterid a typical size was a, a lot lot smaller i mean uh, the bog standard one eurypterus is going to be about 15 centimeters biggest and some of the smaller things that you get are maybe just like five centimeters long or something some of the weird uh, groups that i've worked on so the, the, there's a huge range of size but uh, as it stands they are the current biggest uh, arthropods that have ever existed and i have maybe a little bit of secret knowledge that would say that there's a bigger arthropod that's just been discovered uh, but that is very very preliminary and Ooh. you don't know about it yet. Shh, no one's mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first, folks, but you didn't hear it here. <laughs> so what exactly is your research entailing on these creatures? So I am doing a self-funded PhD, which is both terrible and awesome at the same time. It's terrible because I, have, I actually have to pay to go to university. It's not like everyone else that does a PhD and they get paid to do a research project. I actually have to give them my own hard-earned money so that I can do the kind of project that I want. But on the plus side, it means that I can do the project that I want. And uh, for me, that is looking a lot at what, what kind of extra stuff we can learn from looking at eurypterid fossils. So most PhD projects are going to be like, uh, let's come up with the biggest conclusions we can about the macro evolution what happened during the evolution of whichever group and how did this impact on the world for me it's incredibly blue sky it's just like well let's let's just look really closely and see what we can find if there's anything else that's cool there that's going to be awesome and so it's it doesn't have any particularly well defined project so what I initially wanted to do was to look at their exoskeletons. So they've got this hard exoskeleton, like most arthropods, and in Eurypterids, it's incredibly well preserved. When it when it is preserved, it's normally preserved really, really well. And to the extent that during the whole history of scientific research into the fossils, and I've got a quote here about some of the first work that was done in the 1800s, all right? And this was oh, wow. uh, with some uh, Eurypterids from Estonia. And there was a couple of professors in New York, I think, and they wrote that uh, this guy in the 1800s was able to elaborate the organization in such detail that Eurypterus has really become the most completely known of all extinct animals and our exact knowledge of it is quite comparable with that of its recent relatives. And I don't think that's really changed wow. in the history wow. of paleontology. Like, there's people just don't understand the kinds of detail that you can get from uh, arthropods and uh, eurypterids in particular. So one of the very coolest things that you get with eurypterids is that if you do a palynological preparation so if you use um hydrogen peroxide and it's like in its highest concentration you can melt away rocks all right and they do that in the oil industry uh to get all like grains of pollen out and stuff so the organics preserve but the mineral dissolves away and what happens is that sometimes when you're looking at uh, paleozoic rocks and you dissolve them away you can get little bits of eurypterid cuticle preserved in that and that oh. cuticle it's not just like it, i mean it's it's absolutely tiny it's minuscule but in that you can look at its cross section and see all the layering of how the, uh, the cuticle is composed so it's kind of like um arthropod cuticles kind of like fiberglass it's got crystals of chitin in a protein matrix and it's all crisscrossed to make it really really strong so it's like a really strong biological fiberglass and you can see all of this layering of the individual sheets of this fiberglass kind of structure and then through that you can see all these pores where waxes would have come out and laid over the top of the cuticle and then you can see hairs sensory hairs that are poking out of it and you can see different kinds of hairs. You can see mechanoreceptors. You can see chemoreceptors. So you're not just looking at like, what it's made out of, 
But when you look at these bits of cuticle, you can see how it felt, how it sensed, and things like how it tasted. And that just blows my mind. I mean, this is something. We've got this on the first Eurypterid ever found in the fossil <laughs> record. And this is something that's 460 million years ago. We're talking like almost half a billion years old. And yet people are losing their minds over, and I can say this because he's my supervisor. So uh, Jakob, does a, Jakob Winter does a lot of work on fossil colour and fossil pigments. Mm -hmm. And he's able to work out that the top surface of a dinosaur was darker than the underside. And, right, right. and with all the stuff to do with melanosomes and pigments and the news and people are just like, wow, we can learn so much about these things. And, and yet I'm there thinking like, well, I can actually categorically say how this arthropod was able to see and taste and touch things <laughs> and completely interact with its environment. We've got an entire ontogenetic sequence. We know how it grew. We knew how it worked, how it could see. We knew we can reconstruct what it could see and how it could see it. So we can we know things like the the focal distance of a eurypterid and stuff based <laughs> on comparisons with modern ones. There's there's so much information in there, and yet no one has really properly looked at this. I mean, pe people who study eurypterids and who study arthropods know that this information is there. But beyond that, not a lot has really been done with it. So my work has really come about from seeing um, what other researchers are doing. And there's been a lot of work done recently on the optics and reconstructing uh, the eyesight of eurypterids and working out their ecology based on their eyesight. So... With arthropods, they have compound eyes. Uh, they're not movable, they're not squishy, they're made out of crystals. Uh, because they don't move and they are a single crystal, single shape. So if you have a well-preserved eye in a fossil, uh, you're able to understand how it functions. If, you're, if you have that spatial information, knowing that this lens was here, that lens was here, and they were of this size. It's just, it's just basic optics. It works on physics, and you're able to reconstruct uh, things like the resolution of the eye, uh, how far it was able to focus, uh, how much light it would be able to take in. And so all of that information you can use to say, based on this eye that we have in front of us, it would be best optimized to be able to view things in this kind of situation. And so a lot of work has been done recently on working out what the biggest and scariest Eurypterids, one called um, Acuteramus, it's not quite the uh, 2.8 metres, but it's a pretty hefty 2 metres. And... Uh, <laughs> only 2, only. Yeah, oh, yeah. that's all. Yes. A mirror. <laughs> <laughs> and they were saying that it had terrible eyesight it couldn't possibly be a predator and uh the the first lot of my research has been looking into is is that actually the case and i think that based on uh, my calculations uh, to do with the eyes and this is work that i'm writing up at the moment is that actually in fact um they say that it was a rubbish predator because its uh resolution was too low it's got too few lenses the really huge big lenses uh, but there's so few of them that it could see in really low resolution. So imagine uh, your TV screen is 1080 by 1920 pixels. That's full HD TV. Mm -hmm. And that relates to the number of pixels. The more pixels you've got, the, the higher the quality. And arthropod eyes work in the same way. And they said that this arthropod eye has so few lenses, like having so few pixels, it'd be really hard for it to distinguish any prey items. And yes, that can be true for, for things like if you were looking at text on a screen, you're looking at really small details. But if you were looking uh, on a low resolution screen at say like something that filled up most of the screen itself, say like you were looking at a Zeppelin I don't know why that was the first thing to come into mind. <laughs> but imagine, imagine a big Zeppelin on the screen. That's going to fill up the majority of the screen. So it doesn't really matter what resolution it's in, because mm -hmm. that is going to fill up 
uh, most of the screen. And likewise, I think that these Eurypterids that they said had too low resolution vision to be able to see its prey items, they just kind of assumed that the prey was going to be smaller than it. Where in actual fact, I think that the prey may have been a lot bigger than it. And it was taking down things oh. that were swimming around that were much bigger. This also comes into... Uh, another thing that comes into play is distance from uh, the Eurypterid to the prey. So if you have a low-resolution TV screen and it's on the other side of the room, you're not going to be able to see much detail on that. But if you have a really low-resolution screen and strap it onto your forehead, you know, that's going to fill up all of your visual field. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah. what I think is the case is that they're actually ambush predators of much larger prey when it's close by to them. So arthropod eyes have a, a brilliant way of being able, like they, they see with every single eye in all directions of the eye at the same time. So if something comes into the visual field at the edge, it doesn't matter because it's still looking directly at it with that eye. And it's really good at tracking movement. So if it keeps its head still, it's able to see something moving across its visual field. It will light up one eye first, then the other, then the other across. And it's able to follow something without moving itself. Where, where with us, we have to focus on something, adjust our lenses so we're focused in on it, and then move our entire eye or our entire head as it moves uh, and move along with it to be able to attack it. So yeah. I think that these Eurypterids were lying around just waiting for these huge things to come along. And if you uh, Google Acutoramus, or if you have any pictures on your website, then you'd be able to see just how brutal this thing is. It's got these huge claws, <laughs> and these are filled, like these are, you know, like 30 centimeters long or something. And they are filled Jeez. with what look like steak knives, right? And it would it would just like be able to grasp onto something and just pierce it like with like I can't remember how many it is. It's like fifteen on each upper and lower uh, <laughs> margin, and with wow. a giant piercing spike as well. One of the spikes is just like five times longer than all the others, and. <laughs> It's like jaws. Yeah. It's yeah. like the number of teeth and you have canines <laughs> yeah, functioning exactly. to grip things. Yeah. And so all the different denticles, we call them, like teeth, uh, are have different purposes within these claws, some for piercing, some for holding. Uh, the edge of it is curled, uh, curved around, kind of like uh, calipers. And so that would stop it from leaving the chelicerae. So there, there, there was brutal animals, these things. And yet, because um, of their optics, some people have said that they couldn't possibly have been like really predatory and were probably mm -hmm. just... And some people uh, did some pretty bad um, mechanical studies of them, I think, and said that they were so weak, these jaws, that they couldn't have eaten anything other than worms and other soft things <laughs> and maybe even plants. So uh, what I've been trying to do is to restore these giant, in my opinion, killer Eurypterids <laughs> back, back to their throne as the most scary things <laughs> around in the uh, Paleozoic seas. That, that's really cool. And I, re I really appreciate your pointing out how well we know them because being able to examine optics is something you basically never hear about in fossil studies unless it's like well it had big orbits so nocturnal mm. yeah. yes from our from our vertebrate bias is that, but don't, like eyes don't preserve we don't get to see that the so the idea that you could be studying and you know with arthropods in general they would be able to preserve but that these really old ones we could be looking at how they're seeing the world is a for most people unique uh, you know, fossil experience or, or discussion which is really cool so one of the specimens of uh, the biggest uh, kinds of Eurypterids, uh, the Pterygotids, in uh, New York has a 3D preserved eye, but it's preserved from, uh, you can view it from the inside out. And so what you're effectively doing there is looking at the back of the lens 
And so you're able to see uh, like the shape of the crystal that focuses the light from the back. And so you're able to <laughs> like properly ascertain like what the focal length of that um, eye would be. And uh, a lot of it also comes down to the squidgy stuff behind the eye, which unfortunately we don't have it in Eurypterids. But mm -hmm. if you look at optics in the fossil record for compound eyes, if you look at trilobites, we have specimens of trilobites. I say we, it's got nothing to do with me. But I've seen, <laughs> I've read about <laughs> specimens of trilobites that actually have the cells preserved behind the eyes. That, so that's the equivalent of us having like our retina being preserved in a fossil. Yeah. Like finding a dinosaur's retina would be wow. just the most amazing thing. And yet we have it in trilobites from half a billion years ago. That's incredible. That's amazing. Very cool. You know, we, we, when we run our podcast, our normal episodes, we are the ones who are in the position of knowing stuff, right? We're telling people <laughs> stuff and we say all the cool stuff. One of the great things about having guests is that <laughs> this, Dave is blowing our minds with this. This is super cool. Yeah, yeah. Just getting to hear all the neat things. <laughs> and we did this because we are vertebrate biased and we want to know more about invertebrates. And this, that, this is such cool information and such cool research you're able to do. I've always been fascinated by invertebrates because you were mentioning the fact that no one seems to be talking about the fact that we have such an incredible record preserved so ridiculously ridiculously well for animals that are older than most of the fossil animals that people typically talk about and it's it's just that for so many people invertebrates are such alien critters that it's much easier to relate to it's something with four limbs and a face you can recognize even if it's different but i think they they get the short end of the stick on the reporting because just because of that, but they really don't deserve it because there's so many cool things. The like the whole concept that their eyes are made out of crystals alone is not something that people typically get to hear about, which is amazing and awesome. That's that's just a cool sentence. Well, for me, it's it's completely the opposite way around. I feel sorry for people doing vertebrates because I just work with the outside of the animal. And in arthropods, the outside is the stuff that's... The cuticle of an arthropod is its interface with its world. All of its ecological interactions happen through that cuticle. As I was saying, yes. uh, if you have the cuticle preserved, you have the surface through which it fell, it tasted... Um, it protected itself, it, it was able to digest food uh, in its gut, which mm -hmm. has a cuticle through it. Everything happens through its cuticle. And all of the stuff inside, like, we, we don't really have any clue about. I mean, we know that it would likely have had muscles, we know that it had a gut and uh, uh, reproductive tissues and stuff. But other than that, I mean, we don't think about it. Well, at least I don't, because everything that you have is on the outside. <laughs> and so when I'm looking at a new species, I'm like, okay, this one has got this segment here, 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 here. Then it gets a bit thinner, and then it's its post-abdomen. And in this one, it's here, here, here. Then it gets a bit fatter. Whoa, wait, that's a new species. <laughs> and and that's what it's like for me. It's a lot simpler. <laughs> Whereas when I think about vertebrate paleontology, I mean, you're looking at a bone that you have to take into consideration was inside of something. You're looking at the muscle attachment scars. Which muscle is that? How is it attached to here? There's a hole that goes through mm -hmm. it, which would have had nerves or blood vessels or something. And... There's so many different interacting elements that go into just one single bone that I think it's a, a lot more difficult. And I have a lot more respect for people who work on that kind of stuff than uh, do on arthropods, where it's all just superficial. Very this cool. is a great crossing of the streams here. <laughs> <laughs> so we know that uh, from talking to you uh, a little bit earlier that you're looking not just at the eyes, you're also doing some research on the claws, right? Yeah, and, and this is something that if um, the optics blew your mind, Will, then I think that the claws might be able to do <laughs> a little bit better. So I'm ready. Okay, if you think of a crab, we all know that crabs have really mineralized cuticle. They're, they're made of, uh, they have calcium carbonate to strengthen it. So when I was talking about the plywood before, uh, sorry, the fiberglass with the crystals and the proteins, 
Mm-hmm. Crabs add in calcium carbonate, and it changes the properties of the cuticle. Makes it harder, makes it more resilient to abrasion and stuff like that. Chelicerates don't mineralize their cuticle, so they're a lot more flexible. But they do mineralize in places. Okay, and that's where a lot of my research is focusing at the moment. So, um, in similarly related organisms, so uh, scorpions, this is where all this research came from. If you look at a scorpion's cuticle, and if you look at it in an SEM, and if you look at uh, the backscatter, where you can work out what kind of elements are in any given material, scorpions have at the end of all of their high wear areas uh they have metal so crabs have yes. calcium carbonate scorpions have metal so in their sting they've got metal in their claws their pincers they've got metal in the ends of their feet they've got metal and that makes it a lot harder it changes the property makes it more resilient so scorpions oh, i didn't know about the yeah. feet that's awesome <laughs> so there's there's a really easy way of seeing where this metal is and that's if you just look at a picture of a scorpion. Uh, the ones in Mexico are pretty good. Hadrorus arizonensis, I think it is called. Anyway, that's a really light scorpion. And if you Google that uh, and look at the ends, the tips of all of its high wear areas, uh, they're all jet black on an otherwise kind of like light brown scorpion. Similarly, if you look at Eurypterids, you can see... Uh, <laughs> on these things that have these huge teeth uh, or these huge like grasping legs and appendages that the tips of all of these are black and so my hypothesis that i'm trying to work out at the minute is are these uh, related to the incorporation of metal into all of these claws and jaws and stuff and in scorpions it's iron it's nickel and it's manganese so all of these weird heavy metals that just make this structure so incredibly hard uh that it'd be able to pierce through quite a lot so it, it could be in scorpions when you look at those it's up to a third of the uh, cuticle in in weight is wow. actually metal and and also in in other places in the uh invertebrate world as well worm jaws have zinc in them so things like all these underwater worms have zinc and i think uh chitons have the hardest known biologically produced uh structure in all of the animal kingdom wow it reminds me from the vertebrate world uh there are a certain group of shrews that very famously have red teeth because they're incorporating, mm-hmm. I forget exactly what it is, but they're incorporating uh, mineralized components into their teeth that gives them that red color. I think some rodents do it on the, the front edge of their teeth as well. Beavers especially have that orangey color for the strength. But the scorpion, like I knew scorpions had it in their stinger, and I think I'd heard about the claws. I didn't know about the feet, which is awesome. And it would be super cool to find out that truly ancient relatives and and cousins were doing the same sort of stuff so you really are trying to restore these creatures to their predatory image with (laughs) with super eyesight and wolverine claws it's not actually wolverine claws but yeah i like that i'm gonna use that metal go for it you got metal in its claws cyborg (laughs) sea scorpions (laughs) yep so 2.8 meter long metal jawed Killer scorpions. Crystal targeting systems. Oh, that's <laughs> wow, that's that's man, awesome. That, I like Eurypterids before this conversation. Yes. Actually they held a Eurypterus, the, the species Eurypterus remipes, is the state fossil of my home state of New York. So I've always had a, a special place in my heart. Mm-hmm. But this is even cooler. <laughs> <laughs> now, of, of course you do more than research. Uh, one of the things that we find, the more you talk to scientists, the more you find that they they tend to do things beyond you know just being in the lab. Uh, let's talk, if if you would, tell us about 
Paleocast. Introduce Paleocast for anybody who doesn't know what it is. So Paleocast um, is a paleontological podcast in which we interview uh, expert academics about any given topic. It could be anything from a new paper out to a large letter to uh, a method. Uh, we've had artists, uh, computer game developers, a whole range of different people. And we've been going since 2012, so yeah, six years almost now. Uh, other than that, yeah, I don't know what to say. It's a, it's a paleontology <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Go listen to it. <laughs> yes. If you, yeah, listeners, if you have not listened to PaleoCast, you definitely should. It's very fun. Uh, we were just saying before, I'm going to date this recording a little bit, but as of this recording... The latest episode of PaleoCast is about squamates, so I have to go listen to it and talk about lizards and snakes. <laughs> but PaleoCast has done other things, right? It, it's it's more than just the audio recordings. You have a website with lots of resources. You've done other. What are some of the what are some of the side projects that have spun off of that? So um, one of the things that we did pretty early on was um, we started to record conferences uh, just because I like to think of myself as a bit of a multimedia nerd. I saw a, a gap in the market. Um, no one was really recording uh, paleontology conferences. So I started going there first and talking to delegates and uh, just like talking about the posters and the talks that the given and then i just thought well if I've, if i've got a camera then i could hopefully just film some of the talks as well and so i started filming it uh which was reasonably successful and by reasonably i mean <laughs> not great uh, so don't look at the earliest recordings <laughs> and then as i started recording them i was thinking well if i've got the video happening here at the minute and i can take a hdmi feed out of the video why don't i just use my big laptop to send the video out live and so then we started live streaming it for the whole paleo cast and the video editing i had to get all of this software and then with that software it had some animation tools and stuff so i was just like well why don't i start trying to make some videos as well and so i started doing video abstracts and stuff and so it's it's really just built and built and built all of this kind of stuff that we do and uh, the latest thing that we are trying to establish at the minute is the paleocast gaming network and that will be using computer games as an outreach tool so if you go on youtube and you look up at any computer game any playthrough of a computer game it's got thousands and thousands of views people are, are mad about computer games online and so i thought like well why don't we get computer gaming paleontologists because paleontologists mm -hmm. are people too and they like computer games <laughs> uh, and i spend a lot more of my time playing computer games than i do uh doing paleontology actually um so it's just <laughs> i was just thinking like why don't we have someone playing this computer game about dinosaurs that knows about dinosaurs and if we if we've got like however many thousand people going to be watching a video anyway well then why don't uh, why don't we use this as an opportunity to teach them something about dinosaurs i mean even if it's saying like okay so they probably wouldn't be able to walk in that way but the way that they did walk is in this and use things that are happening in the game to introduce kind of scientific concepts and a bit more of the real research that goes on in the background so Paleocast has really expanded from what was originally just uh, a podcast and interviewing the experts and listening to what they have to say to actually creating a lot of stuff proactively and uh, yeah really experimenting with formats. It's been a lot of fun to watch Paleocast grow and expand over the past several years. What now you were one of the founding members of Paleocast is that right? Mm -hmm. What made you decide to start a podcast uh because i wanted to listen to a paleontology podcast so at the time i was working uh in an oil company as a micro paleontologist and when you're doing that um you get really really bored really quickly and <laughs> your eyes are busy your hands are busy 
but your ears and your brain are just doing whatever. So I used to listen to a, a whole load of podcasts uh, just as something to do or listen to music. And I was listening to loads of science ones. And when um, like the they would discuss like the latest and biggest paleo news, I'd get really excited, but then kind of feel disappointed at how it was handled. A lot of the time it was just things were glazed over and just skipped over and not really done justice. And I felt pretty bad about that. And so my uncle at the time was head of media at Manchester University, which is very convenient, really. And so he was able to set me up with a, a little bit of equipment, just a, a portable recorder. And yeah, the first interview I did was in New York State with oh. a Eurypterid collector who owns a Eurypterid quarry up there. And it was absolutely terrible. I did such a bad job. <laughs> of recording it. it it never saw the light of day um the first couple of episodes didn't really so <laughs> um I, I i just went and gave it a go just because i had the opportunity and i saw that gap in the market that's excellent we we sympathize one of our earliest episodes the version that is out in the world is the second recording because our first one yes. was terrible <laughs> Yep. Uh, have you had it where you've not uh, remembered to press start on the recorder? We haven't had that, but we did have one Oh, you'll episode. have it soon. You'll have it soon. Oh, you? yeah, we, I know. We had one episode that didn't, one one track didn't save. Mm. And yeah. Do the whole thing. We lost the file. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the, the perils of <laughs> I I technology. once interviewed uh, Sir Alec Jeffries. Um, he was responsible for discovering uh, DNA fingerprinting, that whole area of forensics. And I was interviewing him about uh, DNA and about species concepts and stuff. And this was, um, whilst I had my paleo cast equipment, I was doing some stuff for other people. And this was um, an interview that was part of something that the University of Leicester were doing. And so I interviewed him. And then halfway through the interview, I just saw that my recorder wasn't on. And you just get the, the biggest like wave of panic over your whole body. And, and today, I, I think I've lost about three or four good interviews by not pressing record. <laughs> And a, a lot of the time people terrifying. are cool with it and will come back on <laughs> and you'll try and remember everything that you spoke about and try and get that flow yep. happening again. But yeah, you don't get over that. It still haunts me. <laughs> I mean, just the number of times I'm just looking down at my recorder now, just checking to see if that light's on. <laughs> oh, I've checked like six times mm -hmm. to oh, double yeah. check that we're, that we're actually recording. Yep. And with with everything that I've added into PaleoCast, all the different outputs, all of those have their own technological requirement. And for the live yeah. streaming, you've got your audio, is that recording? You've got your camera, is that recording? Are you outputting to the correct place on the internet? Is the internet mm -hmm. connection still up? The learning curve is very interesting. I, I, I've actually really enjoyed getting to learn how to do everything, but the first time you do each one, has one of those moments of like did did we think of everything <laughs> <laughs> and that and that's exactly the same with me even now i still have all that worry but i've got to a stage now where i'm confident enough that people who have been watching the stream or watch the videos that i make or the podcast stuff that i do have now been coming to me and saying we like what you did with this can we have you come and do this conference for me? And so now from something that was just uh, a way of me to produce a paleontology podcast, that gap to plug that gap in the market has now started to become a career for me. And I'm mm -hmm. getting um, requests for me to live stream conferences. They'll pay for me to go. Uh, today I had one come through, which was nice from one of my friends uh, I've been offered uh, jobs to do this, that, and the other. I've got a contract with the Welsh government at the minute to make them a video. And so all of these little jobs are starting to build up. And the more I do them, the more I get used to doing that stuff. And what has happened recently is that I managed to get myself a job working for the people who make the Attenborough documentaries. So 
Whoa. Whilst they're branded as BBC, they are produced necessarily in-house by the BBC. And there was a company in Bristol that produced a lot of the most famous documentary stuff. And I got a job working with them based on like my paleontological knowledge, uh, but also my multimedia knowledge and the, mari- uh, the marriage of uh, those two. Very That's nice. That's awesome. One of the other major projects I know you were involved with recently was the Virtual Natural History Museum. Can you tell us about that? So, yeah, I would love to. This is this is my pet project. This is the big one uh, <laughs> for me. Uh, whilst Paleocast has been ridiculously successful and we've got awards for it and stuff, uh, the Virtual Natural History Museum is what I really want to see, see the light of day. So the idea behind this... And I should first of all say that it's funded by the good people at the Paleontological Association and the Geologists Association. So thanks to all those. So this project is, it all came around because we were looking for a new website for Paleocast. Uh, So we were on WordPress uh, and we were getting hacked like all the time. And so I was looking for a new website and I came across uh, one quite fortuitously that had a computer game interface. So it was kind of had the same graphics and the same control style as Pokemon, but it was uh, it was a website. And I was just like, yes, I want that. And uh, <laughs> I was thinking like, oh, we could have uh, like it all set out in a museum and you could go and listen to Paleocast episodes by walking around the museum and go and look at uh, an exhibit and it'd be a paleocast episode and all the pictures uh, that accompany each episode are actually uh, presented as the exhibits and wouldn't that be cool but then as i started to think about it i was like well couldn't we just you know actually like literally make a museum so as paleontologists we all know that there's millions of pictures of fossils uh, that museums have. So they, they digitize their collections and make them available on their websites to researchers. So if I want to see uh, one of my giant Eurypterids, I could go onto uh, the Museum of the Royal Ontario uh, and just uh, if I know the number or I know the name of the specimen that I want to look at, just type it in and there's the picture. But those collections are only useful for researchers. But I figured, like, if they're on the internet already and they are licensed uh, free for use, why don't I use all of those pictures from all of the museums all around the world and bring them all together in one place in this huge digital museum? And I started putting the feelers out and saying, hey, uh, whichever museum, would you be keen on this? And they were like, yes. And I said to another, and and before I knew it, I had like the majority of the UK's museums saying that they'd love to get involved and that I had all of their collections. And I was just like, okay, so I before I knew it, I kind of like had the world's biggest paleontology museum <laughs> collections, but digitally uh, available to me. And and so with a load of funding and a crowdfunding campaign, I managed to raise. Uh, half the money for this website it was a, an incredibly expensive website and the web the web developers that we uh used were like well yeah you're not going to get it for half the money but oh we love this idea and it's the perfect use of our technology so yeah go on then we'll give you 50 percent off just because we want to see it nice. happen and so, yeah, I found myself being director of a, a museum, just a digital one. And, and since it's digital, like, there's so much we can do with it. Like, we've got no limits to how many things we could put on display. We've got no limits to uh, how big it can be. And there's mm-hmm. no closing times. You, you can access it anywhere in the world at any time. You don't have to pay to come in. Um, with real museums, if you want to change anything, you have to get all the signs reprinted and all of the labels redone, and then you have to close the exhibit for a week whilst you move things around. With with the virtual museum, you don't have any of that. You can just change it instantly and at no cost. And so 
all I, I think that virtual museums are the perfect place to explore museum content. And it's also fun because it's a computer game. And uh, I'm, I'm just going on the, the biggest ramble right now. And one of the biggest <laughs> groups that we can target as well it are schools and school children because mm -hmm. um, museums are fun to uh, go to. But when you go with your school, like maybe you went once a year if you were lucky. We never went to the museum when I was growing up. Um, and then you're stuck with your local museum. If that is a very specialist museum, then you're stuck learning about what was going on at your local museum. Uh, but with the virtual one, we can bring in uh, specimens from anywhere in the world. So we could have like the holotype of Archaeopteryx and we could have a digital version, a digital scan. So every uh, student could get their hands on the holotype and move it around themselves and have a look at it in different lights and zoom into different areas and all of that stuff. So, and, and we don't have any risk of it breaking. So we can take the best specimens from all over the world. And, and since we've got unlimited space and unlimited resources, I figured, well, why don't we have a school's wing to the museum? And you say which country you're from and what year of school you're in. And then the museum will present you with every single specimen, the best specimens in the world that will teach you what you need to learn uh, to be able to do uh, your course. It's all right there in front of you for free. Uh, teachers can use it. And so, yeah, uh, being an educational resource as well. And then it got the backing from the UK's uh, one of the providers, the writers of the national curriculum. So we're, we're being listed as an official resource of, of schools, you know, it's crazy. And, and this is it's still in development. And we've got all of these people signed up, all of these museums, all of these universities, uh, the people who write the curriculum are all signed up and all in on it already. And, um, and it's just me on my laptop uh, drawing little <laughs> people and little fossils um, is is crazy, but I I really see it as having the most potential of anything that I'm doing. And and yes, at the core of it, we'll we'll still be able to have PaleoCast in there. We'll still have the PaleoCast exhibit, so it goes right back to what I was aiming for. But now it's it's just so much more, and I'm just so excited about it. That's fantastic. That's, That's such a cool project. A it really is the the one of the cool things that comes to mind for me. And you mentioned about people being able to do it all over the world, but you know, because there are places where you won't have an option to go to a museum. You know, period. You know, there's if you live in certain cities, there may not be a museum less than four or five hours from you. And then certain parts of the world where you don't have natural history museums to go to, period. But having this, if you have internet and a computer you can go experience a museum regardless of where you are which is really cool that's, that's awesome that's excellent what are you you're doing a lot of cool stuff there dave <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> doing too much stuff uh speaking of doing a lot the last thing we wanted to ask mm -hmm. in our experience trying to wrangle paleontologists to talk to for this mini series we came across the the issue that we all know very well that paleontologists are very busy over the summer and we are catching you right before a trip. Yes. Uh, just, just very briefly, what are you? Where are you going, and what for? So we are going to be going to the Arctic, Arctic Canada, which is not the first place that you'd think of going uh, fossil hunting. It's it's fairly cold, but unfortunately, it has all the right rocks, and it's got the <laughs> it's got the right rocks that haven't been turned over by thousands of paleontologists for years and years. So the right rocks in all the right places. Yeah, yes. and we will be going to Cornwallis Island in Arctic Canada. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's filled with bears and mosquitoes. And yeah, we'll be out there for potentially six weeks. We're kind of at the mercy of the weather and the helicopter schedule. So um, I'm not entirely sure of... Uh, how much time we'll have actually on site versus how much time we'll have waiting for a helicopter or that we'll be snowed under. 
So whilst we're there, we're going to be looking for the evolution of some of the um, earliest vertebrates and some of the most important groups and see what effect uh, that had on life at the time. And um, during that time in the Paleozoic, obviously you had all of these Eurypterids and I'm going as the Eurypterid guy. And so I'll be looking to see how the uh, population of Eurypterids changes uh, before and after certain key events and to really quantify the impact that a lot of these um, uh, events had. And then also, because we're going to be out in the middle of nowhere and only really kind of field geologists working for oil companies have been there looking for fossils before, and you're getting these gloriously preserved Eurypterids out. And we've got like three or four species so if we're there for six weeks and we're looking specifically for uh, Eurypterids and early vertebrates and stuff like that, how many more will we find? And also, tantalizingly, uh, one of the specimens that came from there is of a really nasty predatory Eurypterid called Carcinosoma. And that has all of these <laughs> huge claws at the front. Each one of those is tipped in black. And so obviously if you get in these... Um, black tips i'm thinking metals and if it's in such well preserved material i'm hoping that that will be some fantastic uh specimens to be able to really nail down whether or not this is uh actually happening and they've got metals in the cuticles so again it's with the rest of my research it's really blue sky let's just go out to this place in the middle of nowhere where we know we have so many eurypterids and just see what we can find and so I've got six weeks of sitting around in the Arctic. I don't even care that it's the Arctic. I mean, if this was anywhere in the world, <laughs> I am I am going to be there. And I'm going to be there with my hammer until they drag me away. They're going to just tie a rope around my <laughs> ankles and just fly me off the island. <laughs> it's had to dart you. Yes. <laughs> well, we hope you have a great trip. We hope you find some Absolutely. really cool stuff. Uh, you'll probably be back by the time this comes out. We're recording this way early. The, these episodes will be out later in the year. Dave, thank you so much for joining us for this inaugural episode of our Spotlight series. If our listeners have enjoyed this as much as we have enjoyed it, where might they find you on the internet? Paleocast.com and vnhm.org and all over social media. Excellent. Yes, go check out Dave where you can find him and all of his cool projects. The ever-growing list of projects. Yes. <laughs> Again, thank you so much for joining us, Dave. We really appreciate it. And thanks for having me. It's been great fun. It was a lot of fun. And listeners, thank you, as always, for listening. If you enjoyed this, we will be continuing this series. This is part one of several. So join us next time when we talk to the next person on our list that's <laughs> we'll see you then <laughs> bye bye everyone <laughs> brilliant thanks for listening to the common descent podcast you can follow us on facebook twitter youtube and check our wordpress blog for pictures and links after each episode Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.